Dr. Kilvington, in my humble opinion, you're a waste of space. That's what somebody said to me online. I didn't reply and I didn't lose any sleep over it. But reading that was a little bit uncomfortable because in that sentence, that person, whoever they were, they were attacking me and my profession and my academic work. And it made me think, would they have said that to me face to face? Probably not. But the internet has provided this platform, hasn't it, where we can say absolutely anything to anybody at any time and probably get away with it. So I was insulted online, and some of you in this room may have been insulted online as well. It's not very nice. But online speech can be far more insidious. And what about online racism, sexism, homophobia? As a researcher, I'm interested in what motivates online hate speech, the impact that it has on its victims, and what the solutions might be in challenging it. Now, hate speech is defined as spreading hatred towards an individual or a group based on their protected characteristics. And if it's left unaddressed, it can contribute towards acts of violence. There must be a balance, though between protecting free speech, which is hugely important, but challenging prohibited speech as well. But how bad is the problem of online hate speech though? Well, in the few months leading up to Brexit in 2016, guess how many tweets were sent worldwide that contained a word that was considered anti-Islamic? Have a think of that number. I'm not gonna put anybody in the spot, don't worry. But have a think of that number, okay? The answer is 4.1 million. It's estimated that between 10 and 20% of college students in the United States have been cyber bullied. And around a quarter of those who face persistent cyber bullying contemplate suicide. The Labour politician, Diane Abbott, she receives almost half of all abusive tweets that are sent to female politicians in the UK. And just imagine that now, receiving over 500 abusive comments every single week. And in fact, Amnesty International recently reported that one in 10 tweets that mention black women are considered abusive. Now this wouldn't happen offline, but online for some people and some communities, this level of abuse is facing them every single day. Now, academics are generally obsessive people. There's a few in the room. And I am obsessive when it comes to research projects, especially when I don't know the answer. And it was that question, what motivates online hate speech, was one that I couldn't really turn away from. I wanted to know more. So I began reading. And it was the work of Canadian sociologist Irving Goffman that really struck a chord. And it was his 1959 book, The Presentation of the Self in Everyday Life, that it's a place where he put forward a theory to help us understand human interaction, behavior, and communication. And using a theater metaphor, he said that we offer different performances in different social settings, on different stages. He said we offer front stage performances, which are public and backstage performances which are private. And right now, in this physical space, this is a front stage space. And we learn the rules governing decorum. We learn how to behave and how to act. So as a lecturer for the last decade, I've learned how to generate an expected performance within this space. But you, in the audience, I can see you all, you're all playing a role as well. So, you stay quiet, you listen, you're respectful, you try and look interested. You're doing pretty well, I'm, I'm liking this. You make eye contact, you look my way, you nod, a few nodders in, I love nodders, yeah, and you smile. You do that because that is your expected performance in this social setting. And we learn these rules through repetition. We learn how to behave and how to act. There's also the backstage. And the backstage is, well, it's completely the opposite of everything I've just said. 
It's away from the audiences. It's a, away from those onlooking viewers. And as that curtain comes down, that public front stage mask is removed. It's a space where more honest, borderline or abhorrent views emanate. Now, I believe that we can take inspiration from Goffman's ideas to help us understand online communication, specifically the motivational factors driving online hate speech. So we now have virtual front stages and virtual backstages. The virtual front stage is, well, it's your Facebook profiles, publicly open and visible. We can scroll down and see what you've liked and what you've commented on. And we wear different masks or adopt different personas on different social network sites. So let's think about LinkedIn. LinkedIn reads as a office or workplace environment. So we behave accordingly and we follow the rules and we act professionally. There's also Instagram. And Instagram is like a playground and everybody's fighting to be the most popular kid by getting likes and chasing reactions and trying to look interesting. And then there's Twitter which I find an interesting one because it's kind of like the cubicle door of a public toilet. <laughs> Just imagine that, loads of anonymous insults etched into that door. But we also have the virtual backstage as well. The virtual backstage is, as I've said before, away from those audiences, away from onlooking viewers. And this kind of takes place on WhatsApp, so it's private and direct messaging. And this communication is not fit for public consumption. It's a space where dark secrets are shared or more derogatory views or in some cases inappropriate or offensive humour. Now, can we simply apply Goffman's ideas from 1959 to help us understand online communication, specifically the motivational factors for online hate speech? I don't necessarily think so and instead what we've got to do is update existing theory. We've got to reshape it, rethink it, and remodel it. Because the nature of communication and the conditions in which we communicate are different between online and offline. And this affects behavior. I suggest there are four key differences, as we can see, that affect online and online conversations and interaction. And this challenges Goffman's original model. First, Anonymity. Online anonymity allows us to feel undetected. It allows us to feel off the radar and it gives us that sense of disinhibition. Second is invisibility. And online, to some extent, we can be invisible. And if we're not looking into the eyes of somebody that we are saying something offensive to, then we are less likely to be aware of the consequences of our actions. Third, for some people, they perceive the internet to be this make-believe dimension. And as soon as their smartphone or tablet clicks away to that black mirror, well, normal rules are restored. And fourth, some websites, including Twitter, encourage rapid response. And the quicker we are to post our first thoughts or our knee-jerk reactions, the more likely we are to post something that we may later regret. New technology is changing our world, and these differences are affecting human interaction, communication, and behavior. And while offline stages were distinct and separate, front stage, backstage, virtual stages have blurred. And what I mean by that is that almost all virtual communication, whether it's posted in a front stage or a backstage, it's composed within a space that simulates that backstage feeling. And let's consider our experience of social media as well. Our profiles are populated with our friends, fans, followers, and they feel personalized. They feel private. They feel safe and secure. And those are backstage feelings. But in truth, when we post online, we can reach audiences far and wide, well beyond our anticipated audience. And it's this backstage mimicry, encouraged by anonymity, invisibility, disassociative imagination, and spontaneity, that has arguably led to an explosion of online hate. 
And if this behavior continues, then it desensitizes us to it. Our social media profiles have essentially become these filter bubbles. And the more we contribute to them by liking posts and following other like-minded individuals, algorithms work to neaten those bubbles. And the average internet user spends around five hours a day on social media, meaning that those bubbles' edges become firmer until they're almost impenetrable. And for some people, they're growing up online. They're living in this hostile, unfiltered, and unregulated world where their ideologies are being reinforced rather than being challenged. They've become these echo chambers, and it equips some people with that confidence to post hate where it becomes normalized. And others, they're turning online hate speech into real-world, offline hate crimes. They are becoming breeding grounds for polarization and radicalization. Now, although the internet was originally heralded as this free and equal and inclusive space, and of course, there are benefits to the internet, don't get me wrong, there are benefits to social media. It's been a, a platform where we have highlighted racial inequality and injustices through Black Lives Matter. Also, thanks to social media, we are talking about climate change more and more. There are clearly benefits. It's led to positive mobilization. On the flip side, there are problems attached to these platforms. They are being used to spread and incite violence, hate, and misinformation. And the UN reported that Facebook played a determining role in stirring up hatred against the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. And it was also reported that social media was used to fuel the civil war in South Sudan. Research clearly shows that where hate speech rises online, it simultaneously rises offline. There is a connection. There is a correlation here. And I don't just mean in response to trigger events, such as a, an election result, a terror attack, or a footballer missing a penalty kick. No, hate speech is a process. As we continually discuss and debate divisive agendas set by the media. Now, challenging online hate is complex because the internet transcends nations, cultures, legal systems. However, within my work, I have put forward several recommendations for reform to challenge online hate and discrimination. And these include tougher sanctions, the development of AI technology in detecting hate speech, challenging those insular algorithms, and education. It's that final point, education, which is key. And the reason why we are seeing this online more and more and hearing about it is because these attitudes and these ideologies still exist. I am biased because I'm a university lecturer, but I believe in education. I believe it can be a powerful thing. It can be weaponized in the fight against these ideologies, these worldviews, and these behaviors. And there's countries such as Germany and Singapore, they're actively educating their citizens about online hate, how to identify it, how to report it, and how to be media literate. And considering what happened in Myanmar and South Sudan, as well as with Brexit, education about online hate, discrimination, fake news, misinformation, propaganda, that is essential for all but it's not just down to education. Social media organizations must take a more proactive role in challenging the problems that are plaguing their platforms due to the impact on society. As I head towards a close, I want to return back to Goffman. And it's my favorite quote of his. And he says, in truth, the world is a wedding. Think about that. At a wedding, we wear our happiest mask. Honesty is well and truly suppressed. <laughs> and how many times have you said, it's a magical day? And we say that all the time. And this 
is something where he says that as we navigate our way around front stage spaces, we try to be the best versions of ourselves. Is that happening online? No. Many virtual spaces and stages have turned toxic, full of hate, abuse, discrimination, bullying. Now, Goffman's remodeled work allows us to understand the motivational factors driving online hate speech. And it's that backstage mimicry that gives us real insights into contemporary audiences' attitudes and ideologies. And it shows that we still have a long way to go. It also illustrates the importance of research into online communities and online behaviors. But it's not too late to change. Those filter bubbles can be burst. Ideologies can be challenged. And education can play a key role in achieving and securing change and turning the virtual stages of hate into the virtual stages of inclusion and respect. Thank you.